what I'm going to do is whiz through uh, the slides. I've updated a bit for those that have already seen it to add on a few things. But really, this is a uh, kind of a overview of the territory of product strategy as I see it right now. And I have this newsletter called Pivot Product Hits, which is all about product strategy. So I spend a very, very tragic amount of time just kind of reading and trying to keep up on, on top of what's happening. So the idea is, is, is this is my insights from, from doing that research over the last two to three years. And for anybody that works in a small company, especially a startup, they'll know that even talking about product strategy is considered like a complete waste of time in most cases. And for anybody that's trying to be trying to implement jobs to be done and any of the good stuff that we've been talking about, really just raising people's awareness and getting acknowledgement of its value is, is the first step. And the first, certainly my, my experience of is that it's just theory. And the immediate reaction, particularly from our good friends in the engineering community and those that are doers and executors who want to just build, is that what's the point? This is great academic theory. And I have spend quite a lot of time as a consultant, either with Castle or previously, trying to sell in product strategy services into startups and various companies and just got nowhere in most cases, give or take. And this tends to be the, the kind of instinctive reaction. And, you know, my view is that I see a lot of startups who are just building, 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 a lot of companies building, 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 a lot of teams building, building, building. And... The reality is a lot of them end up going nowhere, a lot of them are going to fail and that's just startup economics. But a lot of the time I think they suffer from the whole kind of Cheshire Cat issue which is that if you don't know where you're going, anywhere, any road or route can take you there. And so the internal discussion, it just meanders and then therefore the team meanders. So for me product strategy is about very clearly knowing where you're trying to get to. And obviously the jobs to be done ties into that because that's looking at the outcomes and working backwards to the technology. All those great Steve Jobs quotes from a million years ago, start with the customer experience, work back to the technology. That's not new thinking, but every generation has to relearn it from my experience because everybody just still makes those same mistakes. So this is not about that classic what is product strategy talk where you talk about the roadmap and you talk about the vision and how strategy links the roadmap and blah, 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 blah. That's the sort of stuff that Marty Kagan and Roman Pickler do much better than me. And is much, you know, that's not really what this is about. The best analogy that I can come up with is this is about lenses. This is about six or seven different lenses that you can apply to any company, any business, uh, certainly any product. And then try to understand what the value is, what it is you're doing through those lenses. And it should be free, so anyone could do this. It should require almost no training, so anybody could pick it up and say, okay, I'm going to run this exercise for my product. And it should immediately deliver results. So it's not a six month exercise or a 12 month exercise like a McKinsey strategy piece. It's something that any top team or any product team or any executive team should be able to do in an hour and immediately get clarity or at least understand how they internally differ over fundamentals. And so, in the context of what I was saying before, my sense of what, where product strategy is right now is that there's a lot of different individuals all commenting and having their own school of thinking and their own lens on what product strategy is. None of them are particularly well known, or at least you know, global, globally recognized folks like, a, like a Mark Zuckerberg is or uh, Jeff Bezos is. And none of them are really, all of them have their own kind of followings and their own um, kind of groups of, uh, you know, schools, but almost none of them really talk to each other. So there's a lot of unjoined up individual thinking going on. And, you know, at some point, I think there's value in trying to pull some of that together. So strategy is ultimately, and this was more for the products that count audience that tends to be more about executors and operators, it's about transcending this notion that you know, product is about screens and features and ultimately that's what you're talking about. Uh, it's about kicking it up from that into a much wider understanding. And what I've tried to do is boil down the different ideas, the different schools of thought that I've seen 
into a number of different categories or a number of different lenses. So strategy is what is it? Or your product, what is it? It's about the job, it's about the value, it's about the journey. Because each one of these commentators uh, has their own take and their own kind of nuanced understanding of how to approach a product or the lens through which to see it. Um, but above all, I definitely wanted to start with who I think are the, is the real meta thinker right now, unquestionably the leading uh, exponent of just strategic thinking in tech right now, and by far the most productive writer. And he is really extending what I think is a great concept that a guy called Anju Sharma came up with. So if you ever want to sound impressive, you can always talk about stack fallacy. Uh, stack fallacy was coined by a guy called Anju Sharma, and he was basically observing that in almost every single context, uh, everybody, every technology organization and every company always thinks that they are, they're the most important part of the stack, right? And so, you know, if, even if you're a piece of middleware or you're a database company, everyone thinks that they're so bound up in their own environment that they think they're the most important thing. But Andrew Sharma's conclusion is that ultimately success in the market at a huge, you know, at a real global winner-takes-all scale is about fundamentally the company that understands the user better. And in, a, in an age of technology, that's very easily overlooked because we've all seen dozens of startups and dozens of companies that are really just a piece of technology that is looking, it's an answer looking for a question. And I was at a strategy workshop with one of the um, partners from Notion Capital the other day, and he drew a really interesting kind of schema where he said, look, you've got two vectors that pretty much uh, encapsulate how we as a venture capital firm, Notion Capital, look at companies. You've got market insight on one axis, and you've got differentiated technology on the other axis. And he said 98% of the companies that they see, the decks, the deal flow that they've got, are all in the bottom right quadrant in that they've all got differentiated technologies, they're all super good at what they do, they're deep tech, they're leading edge AI, they're leading edge VR, they're leading edge you name it, but none of them have a market insight. So they are all without question solutions, you know, looking for problems or answers looking for questions. And he says the only companies they now invest in and the ones where, they, the only ones they ever see traction are where that leading edge technology is combined with a unique market insight. And that unique market insight always comes from an understanding of people and customers. And he said, in this age, everyone's gone bonkers about technology. They think, that's it. You do some cool, amazing tech, boom, your company explodes. But he said, that's not, that's not what creates, creates value. And so, you know, the first the first concept is what I would call the big idea right now in product, which is the kind of brainchild of this man, who some of you may have seen, but um, is still, I'm amazed, not a particularly well-known guy in, in the landscape. Uh, and this is Ben Thompson, who is the uh, uh, founder and leading author of Stratechery, so strategy and tech Stratechery. And what's interesting is that if you read a lot of articles on technology in the journal, in Forbes, in Business Insider, in even the New York Times about some event in technology, it could be Facebook's earnings, it could be, you know, kind of people getting fired at Uber, you almost always see him quoted within that. And that is because the analysis of tech is almost all coming from this guy and is then being disseminated and distributed across all of the leading edge publications. So next time you read a tech article about a big event in the Wall Street Journal, have a look, and I, he al it's almost always the analysis comes from this guy. They're literally just taking from him and repurposing it. And as you can see, he looks pretty unhealthy, he's got big bags under his eyes, because from what I can work out, he never sleeps. This guy never sleeps. If you don't know anything about him, he lives in Taiwan, because his wife's Chinese, and he's, you know, he's got his family there. And he literally just sits and reads everything imaginable and then churns out some unbelievable, insightful blog post, usually three times a week. And at the same time, he's podcasting and doing all other kinds of stuff. So he definitely doesn't sleep. He's probably not gonna live very long. And, but he is absolutely on the leading edge 
of you know, thinking, and he's one of these people that's more talked about than actually read, because the amount of content he puts out there is just beyond what most people can get their heads around. Anyway, so Stratechery, the big idea behind, from Ben Thompson is this uh, idea called aggregation theory, which is about two to three years old, and he's kind of evolved it over time. And anyone that knows Stratechery will recognise these little sketches that he does. But basically, aggregation theory is his big idea, it's like Einstein's relativity, it's the big idea that helps you understand all the other things that are going on in tech. And basically there's two parts to aggregation theory, there's you know, his notion that what has happened in technology is that two things have, two things have basically shifted in the economic universe that have allowed everything to change in the economy and it's all down to this notion of consumers, suppliers and ultimately distributors has fundamentally shifted. So I'm just going to jump over these. There's two parts to aggregation theory. The first is that owning, to go back to the Andrew Sharma and the stack fallacy, owning the relationship with the user is the most powerful thing in the market. And those that are winning are the ones that have the direct relationship with the user. And this is why Amazon always owns their customers, because they understand that it's owning that relationship with the customer that's the most important thing. So to really be a tech unicorn, that is key. The other thing that's happened is, of course, again, our good friends at Amazon with AWS, the cost of actually distributing and reaching out and adding users has gone down to absolutely zero, thanks to uh, service storage being basically completely commoditized. So whereas once distributing information or goods or editions or magazines or music had a huge barrier to entry because it cost a bunch of money in order to be able to do that. Now it costs absolutely nothing at all. So the marginal cost, he talks a lot about marginal cost of adding an extra user is now zero. So all of a sudden you can serve, it costs you the same to serve a billion people as it does one person thanks to the service base. So all of a sudden that's allowed these huge new businesses to suddenly come out and dominate. And to get really geeky, there's three types of aggregators in his world. Uh, the first is those that um, aggregate around the acquisition of supply. So basically, Netflix is the best example of that, and they are basically aggregating access to supply. So they, Netflix is now the best place to see any movie content and it is growing every single day, it's adding its own and investing in its own but its power is being the place where people connect to movies and films and it just, the more movies it gets, the more users it gets and it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So that's one type. The other type is probably best exemplified by, use, by Uber, um, so they don't own anything. They're one of those companies that everybody talks about. They don't own anything, but they are still insanely valuable. And basically, they are all about, they do, they do incur some costs bringing on suppliers, but they are also ultimately about connecting you know, the biggest group of suppliers with the biggest group of customers. And you know, they're, they're kind of what's called tr supply transaction costs, put them into a specific category. And then the final one is the Googles of this world who Basically, they are connecting content to people in a way that used to be something that was owned by individuals. The Journal, The Times, The Independent or whatever used to own access to content, and now Google's completely blown that away. And above all, he's now observed that there are, there's a whole new category which is called super aggregators. And super aggregators add a third sector into the mix, which is they own the users, they own all the supply, and they own all of the advertisers at the same time. So they've got three-sided business models, which means they've got the most users with the most amount of content, and then they've got automated advertisers just plugging into all of that, and they're just creaming off the middle. And just, you know, if you want to get your head around that and, and, the, and just how valuable that is, and Facebook and Google are the only two that do it, if anybody's watching what's going on with the Senate hearings at the moment in the US, that's the general counsels for Twitter, Facebook, and Google, who right now, and it's been happening all week, are being absolutely hauled over the coals by the Senate, by the US Senate, for this whole issue about Russian advertising 
and how you know the Russians have allegedly helped influence the U.S. election, and it's absolutely brutal. And the reason is because the way Facebook and Google are set up with automated advertising means that they don't know who is advertising on their platform because it's completely automated. They just sit in the middle, and that's why they're so valuable. And what's biting them, and what is potentially going to pull them down is that all of a sudden the, what used to be the most amazing thing in the world is now causing them all kinds of regulatory problems. So this is fascinating what's going on at the moment because you know, they are suddenly saying, you know, Facebook who have always just said, well, you know, we just automate everything. You can literally just go on and automate your own ads. There's no human contact whatsoever. All of a sudden this has started to blow up into their face. But if you're looking at Facebook's earnings and Google earnings quarter on quarter, Facebook posted yesterday 75% up their last earnings on a quarter, and they've been doing that almost quarter on quarter. So their profits are of you know unseen proportions, um, but potentially you know the walls are about to start to come in. So do check out these hearings if you're. Uh, and what what it shows these hearings, which is interesting, is just how clueless most of the political establishment are about how these guys do business and exactly how their business models work. And also how clueless they are about who's using their platform yeah, as well. Yeah. They have no idea, as you said. So the, what they're trying to do is sort of imply that they can act on... So this guy, this guy is, that's the Facebook general counsel, is the one who's taking it the most, right? Because they're the ones that were really in the firing line for the US election. And he is trying to... He's trying to take two lines that contradict each other. One is, we will find the people in the future who are trying to rig elections and we will shut them down. And at the same time saying, we have no idea who is advertising on our platform. Yeah. And of course, they're immediately all over him. They're saying, well, if you've got no idea who's advertising, how are you going to shut down the bad actors? Yeah. And he's, he's completely caught. So it doesn't look good for all of them, but they're, they're so powerful. It'll be interesting to see how it actually turns out. Um, so yeah, moving on, another lens is of course our old friend The Job, I will probably just jump over this because this is all very well known, there's our good friend Alan in the good old days at Wimpole Street, customer jobs is about progress and when I've given this presentation and introduced it, this notion of you know, these images that Alan used to do of kind of how you are ultimately uh, enabling people to become better versions of themselves are very very powerful because many people don't think like that. Two things that are often overlooked about jobs. Everybody knows customers don't want your product, they want to make their lives better, they want the progress. But the thing that everybody often forgets is that products themselves don't have the jobs. It's the people that have the jobs and the products enable them to achieve those jobs. So if you get into a conversation about what job it is uh, that this product does, remember it's the people that have the jobs, you're just helping them with that. Fireball Mario. Uh, this was something that um, Alan talked about a lot that definitely resonated. Uh, you know, this is a famous schematic that's gone around a lot. You know, you are basically making, you know, your customer awesome. So, you know, a good question for a workshop or as a discussion is how are we making our customer awesome, our user awesome, and then that immediately leads into the question of what is what does awesome mean for them? So, what is what is the outcome they're trying to achieve? And it's not unusual for most people not to be able to answer that. Again, another great schematic from Alan. Most people are selling this. They're selling um, the wheels and the hardware and the trucks, but actually the customer's about and the customer is buying this. So easy to communicate, but quite hard to do. In terms of the application of this, I've done a couple of um, strategy workshops recently with clients um, where we, you know, we started with the job and brainstorming about the job, but then ultimately then had to kind of translate that into practice. I used a couple of tools from our good friend Alex Ostervaldo, which were actually really, really useful. And these are clients that are very, very sceptical about strategy and, and any of that kind of stuff. So, you know, it really had to work, otherwise they'd have ripped me to pieces. So we talked a little bit about the jobs, but then ultimately used this board where we'd start here. What's the job? Pains and gains. And then looked at how the product or them, them as a company was solving that. That worked quite well, we did it for about three or four different personas or um, end users that they had in mind. And then we translated that into this, which is the lean product canvas that Ash Moria ripped off Alex Ostervalder's business model canvas. Uh, this is much more product focused and, and much more relevant. And I like the fact that 
it kind of shows how product and market fit together. So you know, you kind of start with customer segments, you start with <coughs> problems, you then understand what the value proposition is, and then you look at the marketing channels. And it's, I, I think this is a great, great tool and a great methodology that even the most kind of skeptical and clueless can immediately relate to. Uh, next one is our good friend Bob Moester and his notion of the switch. So this always goes down well whenever you present it um, uh, but, and has the benefit of being true. This is Justin Kahn from Whale. Um, he is famous for saying that startups mostly don't compete against each other, they compete against no one giving a shit. So this is moving into the territory of really acknowledging the sheer volume of choice that the App Store and the web now offers people, and that even getting awareness is by far the biggest challenge for most new startups who is, you know, are so focused on building the thing, they forget just how unlikely it is anyone's ever going to even give a shit, because getting people to change is hard. I work for a company that works on the service side, just as, as, as an aside, and we've seen our pipeline for native apps go off a cliff over the last few months. Everybody's stopped building apps because, or they've stopped wanting to build apps because, uh, I'm not sure how big a trend it is, because they realize that one, it's very costly, two, you have to support iOS and Android, and three, the likelihood of anybody actually downloading your app and then using it is getting smaller and smaller every day. So I remember going back about four or five years ago when I was at News UK, having a big debate with the CTO in front of a room full of people about, is the web dead? Because when apps exploded, everyone was like, oh, the web's dead, it's all about apps. Now, everything's flipped over. Just, just that's my kind of understanding of where we are right now. And of course, this is the reality. The app store is millions of new things every day. And the harsh reality on the other side is that, you know, we're full. We as people are full, our devices are full, our lives are full. Uh, I read recently that, you know, great quote, that all of us are distracted all of the time. You know, we are absolutely... We have more information and more apps and more technology than we need. And of course, you know, people's usage is now plateauing. It's coalescing around a, a very small core. 80% of people's time is just spending three apps. Top eight mobile apps, probably even more scarily, are, are owned by Google and Facebook. And 50% of people, at least in the USA, download zero new apps per month. So getting that switch to happen is now a much bigger challenge than I think a lot of startups realize. Um, so, you know, going back to the history of why people ever change or adopt new products, uh, there's an interesting backstory about what the thinking used to be versus what it is now. Uh, and it used to be this guy, who's a guy called Everett Rogers, who's not famous at all anymore, but did actually coin a lot of interesting memes that we all know. Uh, he coined this, for those that know it. He coined the term early adopter and early majority and late majority in the adoption cycle, which then sort of paved the way for, for the crossing the chasm and all that sort of stuff which kind of exists here. Um, and, but he's been largely forgotten. But he basically, for the longest period of time, defined the general thinking about why people adopt new products. And it was basically very simple. The best product wins. You do a better product, people look at it, they go, wow, that's a better product than one I'm using now and then they changed. And that was the, the received wisdom for about 50 years whilst people were even talking about it. What changed is that then this guy comes along in the late, well, I mean, he, he was writing in the 80s, but he, we probably, most of us know him from Thinking Fast and Slow, which is, what, 10 years old or something? Maybe even less than that. And he basically completely changed all of that, turned all the thinking on its head, and he... He defined this notion that our purchase decision, just as you were saying earlier, George, and our thinking around why we do stuff is very, very complicated. It's very irrational, and it is entirely in the context of losses and gains. So we think about everything that we do in terms of what am I going to lose and what am I going to gain. And this is known as prospect theory. That was the theory that Kahneman won his uh, Nobel Prize in economics for. And it was literally just about the irrationality of, of product decisions and choice. The three tenets, prospect theory, are, as I said, outcomes are judged in terms of gains and losses. This is how people think. Gains and losses are relative to your own situation. So, you know, what's, what's a big reduction in the price of petrol in France is, 
you know, probably still very, very expensive here in, in the United States. So it's very much relative to your own situation. And the biggest thing that we all know, losses loom larger than gains. So loss aversion. Everybody hates to lose stuff far more than they hate to get new stuff. So if you're not looking at the loss aversion, then you're not going to understand the switch. Uh, so, you know, that, that's a kind of good schema. People feel the pain from the loss much more than they get the pleasure from the gain. That's what's known as the endowment effect, just out of interest. And then, of course, time is a factor because you feel the loss straight away. So if you, if you switch out of something, if you trade something off, you immediately feel the pain of the loss. But you're also likely to, not likely to get the gain until much later. So all these forces are against you. Um, this has um, become known as, well, potentially the 9x rule, but basically what was observed is that there's a kind of, typically for product people like us and product developers, there is um, a huge gap between what we think about our product and how customers see the product. So, you know, customers tend to look at new products and look at their own situation as, you know, three times more, they think their own current choice is three times better than it is, and product developers think their own product is three times better than it is. And that's led to what's known as the 9x gap. So product developers with a new product are often nine times, uh, there's a nine times different in perception. Um, and so what Bob Moester, who's a key jobs thinker uh, from you know, many, many years back, has identified is that when anyone is thinking about adopting a new product, there's four forces that are acting upon them at any one time. There's two that pull them towards the change, and then two that pull them back. And that everybody, and he runs whole workshops on this, every product developer and every startup, to my mind, should do some sort of analysis around this, where they are thinking about, okay, what is the reason why somebody would change from their current situation? So this is the pull, this is the push, this is the, my current situation is broken, it's shit, this product is shit, I'm looking around for something else. And then if they hear about something else that's allegedly better, like for those old enough, I remember when Google first came out and it was just, everybody was just like, this is so much better than everything else and it just drew everybody in. So these are the two things that pull people away from their current situation, but there is also the two that pull them back. So there's the, the habits. Habit is a huge thing to overcome. It's very hard to get people to change their habits. And good enough is always your biggest enemy. You know, if it's good enough, lots of product teams still use Excel for their backlogs because it's good enough. And they don't change to any of the millions of Trellos and Jiras and Ahas or whatever because an Excel, you know, is good enough in many cases. And then there's anxiety, which is, this is the kind of the loss aversion. So, you know, again, great activity and a great thing to think about is what are those forces and, and what is acting on the user in terms of thinking about the switch. A famous quote, Reed Hastings, because this then transforms your understanding of what the competition is. You know, this is, this is probably the best example. Reed Hastings has since gone on to say that his actual comp competitor is sleep. So that's, that's his new competitor. Bottle of wine is old school. Now it's sleep because people are binging on Netflix so much that it's only sleep that's, that stands in the way of Reed's kind of world domination. But that, I think, is interesting because it kind of reconfigures how we think of competition. It's not direct competitors. It's a whole bunch of other things that they could be doing. This is about monopolizing time at the end of the day. Um, so another lens, value. Value is a big thing in product right now. If you want to sound impressive, it never, you never fail to talk about product value. Everybody always loves talking about product value. And the best exponent is this guy, Eric Armquist, who isn't famous at all and isn't even cool because he works for Bain and Company um, and has spent about 25 years working in massive organizations. But he has also done a huge amount of research around the concept of value and what is the value of the products that companies are making. And his conclusion, not surprisingly, is that value is really complicated and it's really amorphous and it's not easy to pin down. And as a result, most people focus on doing this because they don't really know too much about what the value and they haven't really spent much time thinking about what the value of their product is to enable them to increase demand. So he said his observation is that most product people, in fact most people inside large organisations, are mainly about decreasing costs and they're mainly about efficiencies and making things faster, better, cheaper. And they don't really know too much about how to grow, grow demand. 
And so as a result, you know, he said there's this kind of big difference. Everyone's an expert on price, but no one's an expert on value. And so he said that is still the kind of undiscovered, uh, untapped opportunity within business. And in order to give us a head start, he came up with this, this very well-known pyramid of value that, um, in his mind, identified 30 units of value that products and services can deliver. And like everything, he, he ripped it off Maslow, so it starts with a base and the majority are down at the base, but as you get higher, it becomes less. Uh, functional elements are where most companies start, and there's absolutely no shame or downside in having a functional company. It's worked for Uber, it's worked for lots of companies. Um, this is about saving time, it's about saving money, it's about convenience, and that's great, and that's always uh, a great space to be in, but it is very competitive, because most of the startups and most of the new companies are competing at this level. He said there's bluer, bluer oceans and better opportunities, and often higher, bigger profit margins by moving up these, these levels and actually trying to engage with people on a much more emotional basis, or even better, some sort of a transcendental basis. And that's harder to do, but if we look at the apples of this world who never compete on features and are clearly competing on some, you know, much more on a brand and an emotional level, you know, their margins are eye-watering compared to everyone else. So this is also very publicly available and it's a great lens and I think a great activity for anyone to look at their product and understand what, it is, what, is, what are the units that we're competing on. And the other thing to bear in mind is that it's not about being amazing at everything. Right, so even the absolute A players, the Amazons and the Apples of this of this world, they only what I call over-index, meaning are better than the better than the mean, uh, on about eight or eleven different units. On the rest, they're they're average. So the challenge is knowing where you want to compete and really focusing in on that, and not trying to be better at everything because then you end up, you know, being being kind of worse at everything. The other part is the journey. So the notion of uh, a product is actually more about a journey in terms of the customer and understanding what the journey is the customer's going on. This guy is fantastic. Um, I always get his pronunciation of his name, but I think it's Chamoff, and he was the head of growth. He was the original growth hacker at Facebook, basically. So he was the guy that helped grow Facebook from 2 million to 250, 300, 400 million. And um, he is now, like everyone else, um, an investor. He runs a fund called Social Capital and uh, has done very well for himself. And he is very quotable. Um, and he has, you know, amongst many other things, made the observation that actually, you know, kind of product management is about state change. It's about moving to people from never having heard of your product to thinking about it to actually using it. And so as a result, you know, one of the ways that you can think about your product is sort of understanding what is the mindset of the user as they move through this. Initially, they don't know you, then they're considering you, then they get you, and then once they're locked in, they want to customize you. So how does the product support the user through those individual states? And again, you can kind of map that onto the value. So this is, initially, this is more in the marketing space. It's about the promise of value. Then you've got to demonstrate the value very quickly. This is you know, very much in the, the area of onboarding, delivery of value consistently, so every time you use the product you get the value, and then over time you extend the value often into other products and services. So what does that mean in terms of the actual product development? Well here, or the teams, this is, this is the acquisition and the growth team, this is all about them being able to communicate what it is your product does in the best way and to the right people. This is, of course, onboarding, this is the period which has now become a science when People are first trying your product and you need to convince them and show them straight away. Core task completion, so this is when you clearly have a value or a role in someone's life and you just need to be able to kind of iterate on it. And this is the customization, this is how people can administer and change the product to suit their needs. Most people of course start here, so no one's going to start a product with the onboarding. You start with what is it that this product does and then you kind of build it outwards. In terms of how you measure it, this also maps quite nicely against the famous kind of R metrics, the pirate metrics. This is your acquisition metrics. These are your activation metrics. This is retention and revenue, and this is referral. And interestingly enough, the guy, just what we were talking about earlier, the guy that coined these, Dave McClure, he's been sucked in as well because Silicon Valley is having its own kind of 
creep sexual predator problem, as we all know. And Dave McClure has been one of the casualties. So he's had to, he's, he's like Harvey Weinstein, he's been fired from his own company. And unlike Harvey Weinstein, he's outed himself and said, look, I'm really sorry. But he's now kind of been blacklisted. So I'm not sure if we can use the pirate metrics anymore, but just so that you know. Um, so back to, you know, the kind of the, the, the state change and the journey. Another thing that's worth mentioning for those in the B2B space is that if you are in the B2B space, you've got two different journeys because buyers and users are usually two different types of people and they've got their own expectations and you need an onboarding and a, you know, a task completion for each of them that is often separate because they both value different things. And what I found from working in B2B SaaS in a different life is that actually for the buyers of the product, the administration is often the most important part because if they're buying a product for 15,000 or 20,000 users, the most important thing to them is understanding who's using this, how often are they using it, and where's my reporting that I can kind of show that I'm getting value from this. So, you know, if you're in the B2B space, building out this tool set for the actual buyers is one of the most important things you can do. And it's very easy if you're from a B2C background to focus on, you know, the users and how the users get value and, and overlook the buyers. Um, what's happened as a result of onboarding is that it's now become a science in and of itself. And so uh, this guy, Samuel, I forgot his surname. Hewitt. Hewitt, that's it. Um, has really absolutely cashed in with his dedicated... Um, Resource on user on board. Uh, I'm sure we've all seen it, but you know, go and have a look at the teardowns that he does. Always good. Basically, every time there's a new product or a hot product, he comes in and does a teardown where he looks and he maps the onboarding experience and does an analysis. Uh, onboarding again is a science in and of itself, and it's critical. It's critical to success because the dropout rate of, of onboarding is is enormous. It's like 98% for most products, as we know. Um, What's interesting about onboarding is it is the location of this famous moment, this mythical moment called the aha moment, when, which you know, is generally accepted as a real thing, and certainly Facebook and Twitter uh, took it very, very seriously, and Chamoth Palahipatia is well known for saying that you know, he would, they were, Facebook, when he was there, was measuring zero to aha in fractions of a second. So they had it amped up so far that they were literally trying to shave fractions of a second, of, a second from the time it took to go from you first hear about, or you first try Facebook to you get it. Uh, so what is the aha moment is another great exercise for, for all, uh, I think, startups and product people. What is that moment when somebody suddenly understands what this product is? And more importantly, how long does it take for somebody to get there, typically? What does good look like? How many steps is it? How many uses is it? You know, we're not all like Facebook where it's in seconds. If you're in B2B SaaS, it could be months, you know, in, in other products, it's somewhere in between. But the aha moment, I think, is often overlooked, and I still think it's really useful. Uh, that's Chamath, the great talk by him on YouTube about that. You know, growth starts with a deep understanding of product value and is about moving new users to the aha moment as quickly as possible. So for him, that's really what, about pro what product management is all about. Um, Moving on kind of towards the end, uh, often overlooked, but I think definitely interesting and up and coming is this notion of the product as a story. Uh, this lady, Donna Leachaw, was a script writer in Hollywood, so her background is in you know, constructing narrative arcs, which is how uh, films are constructed. And she basically took the way that a Hollywood film is, is written or composed, uh, which is very much about an arc with a climax and a denouement, and said, look, Actually, the journey into a product fo follows a very similar pattern. Um, you know, there is a, you know, you can map it onto jobs. There is a, this, this definitely resonates with anyone that saw Alan's uh, presentation or his workshop. You know, there's your existing state and then there's some sort of trigger. There's some sort of moment that says, this is not right or this could be better and I'm looking around. And then very much as, as Alan used to talk about it, you've then got a moment where you're looking around, looking around, you're finding obstacles, you're getting disappointed. And then all of a sudden you find something that delivers against it. And then all of a sudden, bang, you know, you go back to your current state and you've made the change. And so, you know, she very kindly has suggested a number of templates and shared a number of templates that allow you to actually kind of map your own product journey over this story arc, which is very visual and very easy to do. 
Um, and these are a couple of examples, so check out her website and you can, you can kind of download the templates. Uh, finally, you've probably got uh, the guy that's probably made the best career so far out of you know, a reasonably strategic level of thinking, which is Neri Al and his famous hook, hook model. Uh, he, like all great artists, ripped off completely his tutor at Stanford, uh, who is BJ Fogg, who um, you know, runs a whole faculty around consumer psychology and how computers are impacting our minds. Uh, and he came up with this behavioural model and he defined literally in a formula with behaviour as motivation uh, and ability and a trigger. And he said that people's behaviour is constituted by those, those three factors all coming into play at one time um, and that if you understand that then you can create behavioural change. So he was very much about you know, what affects behavioural change. And so what Yal did is he then kind of ripped that off and then looked at a number of products and he created this notion of the hook where you get a trigger um, that causes you to want to look at a product and most of us now know it as a notification. This is typically the trigger that we are experiencing these days. It could be a new email, but it's some sort of notification. You then take an action that delivers a reward. And that reward uh, is, is variable, it's unknown, and we'll come back to that. Then you get some sort of investment out of it, so you've invested something of yourself in that and then you go back to start. And his, his conclusion is that the most successful products, the Facebooks and the Googles and the Snapchats and the Instagrams, are the ones that have actively constructed how they're moving users through this cycle as frequently and as quickly as possible. Um, and it's a matter of huge debate, but his view is that they are deliberately doing this as is by design. What's most important is this notion of variable reward because that's what brings people in. And variable reward, and we've all seen it, is um, notifications being very obtuse and unclear about exactly what it is. So somebody just commented on somebody's post. You know, somebody just said something about your remark on Facebook. The whole thing is deliberately obtuse in order to bring you into the product because it has been psychologically kind of proved or demonstrated that the... Re the feeling you get when you're trying when you want to find out about this is literally a huge injection of dopamine so there is a kind of physiological response to doing that that is similar to smoking is similar to any sort of craving or addiction you do get a dopamine hit because you're like oh my god what is it that i'm missing out on you go into the product you get a hit and so basically you know these are products built around fomo they're powered by fomo and this is not a small thing it's an absolutely huge thing uh, because that's what you know is creating this notion of all of us are distracted all of the time. We don't like to miss those notifications because we think like, we're missing out. So you know other examples that we've all seen, but according to Neri Al and various other commentators, are very much by design. Autoplay, you know, autoplay. We all know autoplay. Netflix, YouTube, they all autoplay. And it, uh, last time I read fairly recently is that 75% of the, of the content, video content consumed on the web is from video that was auto-played off what you originally started watching. So you start watching something and then 75% of the rest of your time is actually stuff that's just triggered. The whole point being that if it auto-plays, people just keep watching. They just keep watching and they keep watching and they keep watching almost forever. And anyone who's got kids will know that's true. Notifications that interrupt you with vagueness, LinkedIn, Facebook, we've all been there. Images that, that load slowly. Anyone's noticed, looked at Instagram and it's kind of all fade out and you're thinking it's something, something to do with latency. Apparently they do it deliberately in order to draw you in because you're waiting for it to load and it's done by design. And then of course, infinite scroll. That's as old as the hills, but that's all part of it. And the whole, like, the whole point is that these are all products that are monetized through advertising, so the longer you spend, the more money they make. And then the big, the big issue right now, which I, you know, since we kind of talked about it a few months ago, I'm just seeing kind of come up everywhere, is this notion of addiction and product addiction and the uh, ethics of addiction. And this was uh, something that came out over the weekend in The Guardian, uh, literally talking about all the kind of players that we've been talking about, Tristan Harris, who've been talking about this for a while. And now you've got the guy that I think, he, if I remember correctly, he was the guy that invented the like button uh, on Facebook. He's come out and said, look, you know, this is, this is really bad. It's all being designed in order to lock us in. So 
you know, it's become like the big ethical debate of the now in product. So just to kind of wrap up, you know, always critical to bear in mind, you know, focus on the progress. It's not about the screens. Always start with the progress. Understand the forces of change. So understand what it is that is impelling somebody to make a change. Why should they give a shit about your product? Um, what is ultimately going to make that behavioral change? Focus on the value and understand how you're delivering value. Know your aha moment. Always good to know and discuss what is the aha moment. What's the story that the user has? What's the product story? What's the user's story? And then understand the triggers and the rewards. So this was my kind of summary of the different lenses and the different strands in product strategy. Uh, and that was about it.